Mind Your Farm Business on realagriculture.com is brought to you by RBC Royal Bank. Welcome to the Mind Your Farm Business podcast brought to you by RBC Royal Bank. I'm Sean Haney, founder of realagriculture.com and host of Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. You can find more episodes of this podcast by going to mindyourfarmbusiness.com. Many of you know that I'm a big follower of sports, as I believe it's a great way to teach kids life skills that can be applied the, the rest of their lives. In addition to that, though, there's also parallels of coaching and sports management to entrepreneurship, things that we deal with every day as farmers and ranchers. Coaches have to deal with technical aspects that involve strategy and tactic development, dealing with team members that are different from each other in terms of what motivates them, and also variables that are completely out of their control. Does that sound familiar? In this episode of the Mind Your Farm Business Podcast, we're joined by Greg Hamilton. He's head coach and director of national teams for Baseball Canada. In his role, Hamilton has led the junior national team program to two WBSC U18 Baseball World Cup bronze medals and one silver, while seeing an impressive group of program graduates reach the big leagues, including MLB All-Stars Jason Bay, Russell Martin, Justin Morneau, Michael Saunders, and Mike Soroka. Hamilton has put together a national team squad that has won three Pan Am game medals, competed at two Olympic games, and all four World Baseball Classic events. Greg and I are going to cover a wide swath of topics, including building a team for a short period, the importance of process over outcome, and whether character really matters in today's world. Greg, welcome to the Mind Your Farm Business Podcast. Yeah, I'm excited to be on. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, okay. So give us some of your background, Greg. Um, you know, I introduced you as the coach and director of national teams with Baseball Canada, but fill in some gaps there for us. Uh, give us some of your background. Yeah, it's been a, bit of a, a little bit of a winding road to kind of get to here. Um, I came on full-time in 98 at Baseball Canada, so it has been a while. But previous to that, I, I went to, to the States as a, as a student athlete. I played uh, baseball and hockey at Princeton and graduated and had a tap on my shoulder my senior spring as a as a uh, from a from a uh, coach that I played for. I asked if I had an interest in getting into coaching and really never thought of it and kind of left it at that. It was sort of one of those you know, out of the blue conversations on the way from practice. And anyways, a year later, uh, it kind of stayed on me, and I started uh, to think it might be a good idea after it kind of had a foray into the business world, and I pivoted and went back and started out as an assistant coach at Princeton, recruiting coordinator. And from there, kind of had an interesting journey. I went, to, uh, was able to you know finish up there. I went overseas for five years and coached in southern France, which was a great experience and opportunity to kind of build programs from the ground up, which was exciting. And create some baseball connectivity in a country where there, you know, wasn't a lot of history or heritage or, you know, it certainly wasn't the, you know, the sport of choice for, for most. And I you know, had to kind of culture a lot of people around it. So I had that experience, which was wonderful. And then came back, coached at the University of Maine for a little bit as a recruiting coordinator and assistant, uh, assistant coach. And sort of through that time frame, kept my hand in the national program here and coached uh, seasonally because that's what it was. There was no full-time coaching position at Baseball Canada at the time, so I would just come back and coach the national program in the summer as a pitching coach and then as a head coach. And the junior team in our Olympic programs, a pitching coach in that program. And then uh, in 98, Baseball Canada, along with a lot of other uh, organizations, there was some government funding to hire coaches in particular. You had to use that envelope of money to hire a coach, and obviously it came with a lot of other responsibilities and duties. So left the University of Maine and came back to Canada and been doing it ever since with our junior national team and our senior national teams and our World Baseball Classic and Olympic teams. And it's, uh, it's great, really exciting opportunity to kind of live my passion day to day in our country and, and impact Canadian kids and Canadian program. And so it's, uh, yeah, it's been a great journey and I really enjoy it. Yeah. You know, people talk a lot about how Canada is really making strides in the professional game when it comes to basketball. And there's kind of the Vince Carter effect. But, you know, baseball, Canada more and more, and we've got the World Baseball Classic coming up here, but 
Canada is uh, baseball is becoming much more of a popular game, and it's really showing in the talent that. And you you play a big part in that. You know that that those 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 steps to uh, take people to the, that next step to the professional ranks. But it's not all about that. But uh, Canada's really in the growth mode when it comes to baseball. Yeah, I think there's a lot of reasons. Obviously, uh, there are, there are a lot of you know, players that have, you know, young athletes that have gone south of the border and through the U.S. collegiate system and then come back and have started to coach. There's a lot more players that have played professional baseball at the minor league level and some at the major league level that have kind of come back and sort of got involved in baseball at the grassroots level and through the sort of youth elite programming systems. And, you know, so the coaching is really elevated. The programming has really elevated. There's a reach beyond the border more so than there ever used to be to, you know, go down south and play in events and tournaments. And, and there's programming here that, uh, you know, that, that operates kind of year round academies and, and, you know, also extensions of associations, which I think of, you know, just, it's just more involvement from people that have more perspective, more experience. There's, and the system is really elevated as a result of it. And, We've tried to do that for years with our junior national program. We kind of recognized early that, you know, that we needed to kind of run a program that had a year round component to it. We needed to, to get down south and, and play in a professional environment, even though they're high school kids against professional competition, so that you, you know, you really expose them to, to the level of play that would really push them developmentally. And you got, you know, really good athletes and you put them in an environment that challenges them developmentally. And, and it's a professional environment, it's professional competition. And, you know, it compares them to the next level. So a lot of that is kind of cyclic. It's come full circle. More and more people are back involved and, and involved in the game day and day, day in and day out, which has made a big difference. Yeah. And, you know, baseball is a very, is very unique in the sense that it's, it's very, in, in some ways, so individualistic, but in other ways, such a team sport. It, it really is. It is so so unique in that regards. I mentioned the World Baseball Classic that at the time of this recording, we're it's just it's just about to begin here very very shortly. You've been you know a big part of putting that team together, uh, also the national junior team as you've been uh, alluding to as well. So, for for a lot of our farming and ranch audience, they're also putting together teams, you know, staffs, uh, people to to assist in the in the production of the cropping season or livestock production. There's differences, but there's also similarities. So, fr- from your perspective, what makes up a great team? What when you go through that process, what does that actually look like? Well, I think you have to identify talented people that are that have a passion for the product that they're going to be involved in. Because in our world, and I'm sure like your world, everybody has to learn. There's a development component. You have to learn either how to you know grow your abilities individually. And then get and merge those abilities within the overall team or the overall business. And I think in our case, it's the overall team. In your case, it's the overall business. And try to convince people that it's a process day in and day out of getting better. It's a process of day in and day out of focusing on you know, getting things done that need to get done and not getting caught up in the big picture of things, but taking care of the immediate moment and the immediate um, developmental aspects that you need to, to get better at. Um, and it's also getting to understand, certainly in our world, that, you know, in order for teams to succeed, uh, individuals, two things, they have to be comfortable setting aside individual, you know, uh, tendencies for the overall betterment of the group and betterment of the team. But as the team grows and succeeds and gets better, so do the opportunities that individuals end up receiving they tend to grow so i always say to young developing players that you know yeah you have goals you have objectives they they can be individualized things that you want to accomplish individually places that you want to go beyond say our junior team when you you know you want to get a scholarship and you know the states you want to get signed and play professionally uh, but you're part of a team so if your team succeeds and does well then there's more eyes on you there's going to be more opportunities that are going to come as a result I mean, usually people follow and want to be around and part of good teams, um, you know, as opposed to teams that struggle and don't do so well in cultures that aren't that strong. So if you can create a good culture and everybody's pulling on the same rope and everybody is, is committed to the same purpose, you can have individual goals within that. But if you're, 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 your collective is strong and your culture is good and they care about the product and they care about doing well as a group, then usually those individual goals become a byproduct of it. And usually you get greater opportunities and you get rewarded at a higher level. 
and you know everybody wants people that are successful and and that, that part of success so it, i think a lot of you know, it's merging those individual tendencies into a collective culture and a collective a team that people are proud of and they want to be a part of and they're willing to sacrifice at certain times their individual you know betterment or their individual goals for the, the betterment of the group which ultimately ends up enhancing their situation as it moves forward anyway yeah and that the, the thinking about the collective and the team first you know we hear that a lot we talk about it a lot but in, in some ways easier said than done right because let's just think about it from the aspect of the teams that you're putting together these, these are high achievers the, these are people that throughout their young careers or old careers we talk about the WBC team they have always played for the most part right and and and, yep. and adjusting to where you fit in that team it can be hard and there's probably like this fine line between accepting that and thinking team first versus being perceived as somebody that ah, he doesn't seem to care if he plays or not right like there's that there's that sort of like that line of acceptance and and how people fit into each of those roles inside of a team yeah, a lot of communication, I think, on the front end, uh, which we try to do. We try to make sure that we're very communicative on perceived roles or roles that we feel uh, are important to the overall collective and the overall team. And if a player is going to be, in our world, a role player, we spend a lot of time in identifying that type of player, a player that's willing to be you know, more, you know, have a, a, a greater sense of selflessness than maybe some others. Um, cause that's going to be a huge attribute to, to kind of filling a role, uh, a needed role, a valued role. Uh, you have to be definitely selfless and put aside some of your individual, you know, tendencies and pride and things of that nature that, you know, not be envious of playing time that somebody else might be getting or a more elevated role that somebody else might be getting again, back to the idea that, you know, but reinforcing with that person that, that their role is critical. It might be more isolated and not as high profile as somebody else, but it's ultimately within our clubhouse and within our culture, hugely respected. And in many cases, more respected within a culture and a clubhouse than the person that is elevated who has all that natural gift and that natural talent. They're going to be, you know, they're going to be the headliner. And when you're in clubhouses, the role players, the players that really put team ahead of individual, they're really, really respected, and they really, really do drive success on teams. I mean, you have to have the stars, and you have to have the high performers and the high achievers, but those players have to be insulated because, again, it's a team, you know, and and you see that in our world, and you talk about the World Baseball Classic. You know, we've created a culture that starts with our youth program or young program when they, you know, they come through as young players, and, and they get culture to playing for their country and, and playing as a group and, 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 and you know, going through the journey with, with, a, with a group of individuals that become a team and then they go out and compete against the United States or Cuba or Venezuela or Dominican and you do it with pride and energy and passion and, and you're doing it for the collective culture and, and winning for your country. And, you know, when they come back to play in the World Baseball Classic, as you know, in many cases accomplished major league players with, you know, with, uh, with an identity that is, you know, really, really visible, visible and, you know, they've, they've done tremendously well there at the pinnacle of their sport. But it, it draws them back into, you know, playing for Canada, playing for the group, wanting to win for the group. You know, they really, really do put aside, you know, who they are as, you know, individual athletes in the public realm to coming back and, and trying to succeed as a group for, for their country, which is, you know, it's really enriching and rewarding on a personal level. And I've always said, like, you know, the, the, the success that you have when you reflect in retrospect, it's always about the people that you do it with. And it's always about, you know, when you when you grow and and mature as a group in a team oriented sport or a team oriented culture, you know, where business grows from, you know, a seed to to to, to a field to you know to to you know an industry, uh, you know, you take pride in that, and there's a pride in who you are and what you've created, and and it makes a huge difference when everybody's pulling on that same rope and everybody has a little bit of a buy-in and everybody respects each other's role. I mean, it's never utopia. It's never going to be perfect every day. You're always going to have internal, you know, conflict and disagreement and those sorts of things. But if, if you have a common theme that you can rally around and you can be proud of and you can feel that you're a part of it, that's what makes a team special. And, and I think the leadership group in the team, whether it be the, you know, the coaches and, and veteran players or, 
you know, it's selling that culture and getting people to buy into, you know, the importance of each individual role and, and, you know, successful teams, role players are equally as important. I mean, yes, you have to have the stars or you're not going to win a championship, but if you don't have role players, you're probably not going to win one either. So yeah. you really do in a team environment need the collective to be proud of what's across the Jersey or proud of the business, you know, and have a care. It doesn't mean that you're going to be happy with everything every day, but at the end of the day, you have a rallying point and that is something that you've created together in a culture that you've created that, you know, that, that really you know drives you each and every day to want to work together. You don't have to love the person next, you know, side of you every day. And, it doesn't have to be your best friend, but you have a commonality in what you're trying to achieve. Is it easier to rally people around that here? You know what we're trying to do. We're trying to win a championship. We're trying to win the the gold. We're trying to qualify for the next step. Is that easier to do in a short sprint versus say like a, a major league baseball season? That's 162 games. Yeah, I think you have to, it definitely is for sure. Um, but you also have to, have that culture created fast, right? So, I mean, they almost have to have to show up and they have to have an identity around it. They have to understand what they're getting into. Cause you don't have a whole lot of time to create it, you know, to your point, like when they're coming in for an event and the event's going to be like 12 days or 10 days, it's really hard to create it if it's not already somewhat ingrained in the people that are coming in, or at least you don't have a critical mass of players that really get it and understand and can quickly get those that, haven't been a part of it before up to speed and really get them to feel that emotion and really get them to feel that team concept. And, and the fact that they're there for 12 days to really sacrifice to one another and really, really compete as a group. So you do have to have a leadership group that can get people to understand that. That's why the trade off between veterans and rookies and, you know, inexperience and experience becomes very important over the course of the season. I think you have to be, you know, extra communicative in, in understanding there's ebbs and flows to the season. There are times where, you know, you can back off a little bit and there's times where everybody can exhale a bit and take a little bit of a breather. And, you know, we can't expect that same level of intensity for every hour of every day and not every game is as significant as the other. But, you know, I guess in a world that I wouldn't be as familiar with as you would be, like it would be the difference probably between growing seasons and planting seasons and, you know, and market seasons and all those sorts of things. Well, in our world, 162 games, you know, collectively every game is going to matter because you might miss the playoffs by one game, but you also have to sacrifice some days in order to be better other days. And sometimes you got to have a player that's not playing so that player can be rested and then be back and you're going to get more mileage out of that player, more productivity out of that player if you, then if you push them through every single inning of every game and every day mentally and emotionally. So it's just understanding the ebb and flow that when connected together, it leads to success over a longer period of time. But it's still a belief in trying to accomplish something at the end of the longer cycle that becomes really important that drives people to want to kind of push through things that maybe they would get complacent on if otherwise it wasn't there for them at the end of the, you know, at the end of that season. So a yeah. little different approach, but trying to accomplish the same thing. You just said that word complacency. That's complacency is like the enemy of greatness <laughs> that you, you're just, you're trying to keep that out of the hen house, so to speak, at, you know, whoever's world it is. You know, one of the things you mentioned the the mental focus and intensity, and, and that is one of the misconceptions of, I think the game of baseball is that, you know, I, like I was at a college basketball game last night in, in Kentucky and you know the game's two hours. That's, that's a, that's, you know, that's a short little window yeah. now. And, and people recognize the physical component of that, but there, there also is a mental aspect to it. Baseball is very different yeah. in the sense that, you know, you're, you're playing a double header. That, that could be seven hours of being focused. And, and it's not just the players on the field. It's, it's, it's the player in the bullpen that yeah. may go in. Doesn't, you know, he has a you know probability idea, but, you know, when that, you know, when that call comes down there, th- that switch has to be flicked. M- baseball has this yeah. mental component that is just, uh, to me, is just undervalued. It's amazing to me. Yeah, it's, it, it really is a mental game because when you think of baseball, right, there's really no positive outlet to raging against the ball. Like everything's based on the ball when predicated on the ball. You're either hitting the ball or you're stopping somebody from hitting the ball and that's how you score and, 
So at the end of the day, like you take most other sports, you can kind of exert your physical will in circumstances and your energy level in circumstances. And let's say if it's hockey, I mean, you can, you know, you're going to battle for the puck in the corner. You're going to out desire the other person physically. You're going to out physicality them. You're going to, you know, you're just going to really elevate your intensity level, your drive, your desire in order to win the battles to get the puck. And the thing with baseball is it's, it almost works counterintuitive in that sense because the more energy that you use to get intense and fired up, it works against you. You know, it's like a hitter that I'm going to hit a, a home run on this pitch because I haven't got a hit in the last three games and I'm, I'm going to kill this ball. Well, it just never works out very well because, you know, you're just playing right into the pitcher's hand. He's, you know, he controls really what's going to come, how the ball is going to move, what pitch he's going to throw. So you have to have, I always say, it has to be controlled intensity and energy level and has to be really, really disciplined and focused because there's also ebbs and flows where you're on in the game and then you're on not on the game. Yeah, I mean, you hit three or four times in a game and that's it as a hitter. I mean, you're, you know, you're getting the ball not all the time. You're not necessarily in the middle of a play with any kind of frequency a lot of times. So it's not hit to you. And it's, it's just a, it's a long season. It's hitting in particular is a real mental grind because you can be doing everything right process wise as a hitter, have a really good swing, have put in a ton of work to develop and build that swing, and you can still be 0 for 20 because it's really hard to hit. I mean, not to get into the you know the subtleties of hitting, but I mean it's it's you have no idea what's coming for the most part because nobody's telling you what it is. The ball is not static; it doesn't sit; it moves. You don't know what pitch is throwing and how it's going to move. And you've got to hit a run baseball with a round bat. So it's just a skill of failure. I mean, and if you're, if you're failing at a 70% rate as a hitter, they call you an all-star, potentially a hall of famer if you're at the highest levels. And, you know, it's that 70% fail rate that challenges you mentally to, to believe that your process is right, that your work is been done and that you're, that you're doing everything you can do to control outcome in a, in a skill that, it's impossible to control outcome and, and it's just way more full of failure than success. If success is defined by getting a hit, that is the ultimate in success. I got a hit. Well, you can do everything right as a hit or not get a hit. There's eight guys out there trying to catch the baseball. You might hit a rate at them and it's really hard to hit it. So it's, it's incredibly mental. The hitting aspect in particular of baseball is to say, hey, I'm, I'm doing everything I can do. I'm controlling the process very well. I, putting in the necessary reps and putting in more, you know, extra reps. My swing is really good. I put all this work in to build it, but I never even got a hit today. I might not get a hit tomorrow. And it, that's the mental challenge of the game. It's it's more than anything, it's the hitting part of it. We'll get back to the Mind Your Farm Business podcast, but first a word from our sponsor, RBC Royal Bank. This episode of Mind Your Farm Business podcast is brought to you by RBC. Maybe you've had an idea about upgrading your operation, or finally getting that renovation done, or buying some new equipment, or you want to be a little less reliant on the weather from season to season. Get some help making it happen by speaking with an RBC Agriculture Account Manager. Then, set up an investment plan to make even more of your ideas happen. Visit rbc.com slash chart your course and get started today. You're... you're it's like you reading my notes here a little bit and say in segueing is outcome versus process. That, that, yes. that really is such a, and I, I think it's just human nature, whether you're in the game, out of the game, fan, whatever is, is to focus on the outcomes, right? It's like here, you know, it's, here's where we're trying to get, here's where we're trying to get. And that, that can be exhausting, especially when there is adversity. And as you mentioned, baseball is a game of failure and, and having that hour by the hour, that by the day commitment to following the process. Now, we got to make sure we refine the process and ensure that we're, we're doing the right things. But we, we hear a lot, you know, it's the little things. And that's really what the process is about, right? Like, it's not the outcome. The outcome is going to come. Don't focus on that. Focus on what you have to do right in this minute in order to lead to success. Is that the kind of stuff that you're, you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Because the thing is, you think that human nature is is the excitement for the outcome, right? So there's there's really no reward immediately within the process, right? I mean, if you're working the process, then you're practicing. You're practicing your craft. You're 
you're building a foundation for success, which is going to happen when you ultimately go and compete, hopefully, or it's going to happen down the road. But when you're, when you're putting in the work, I mean, there's really, there's really no lights, there's no camera, there's no, you know, there's no tangible reward. So everybody tends to want to get ahead of the process because everybody wants the reward. Right. And it's those that can kind of understand the value of the process and how it connects to the ultimate reward. And especially when you start talking about a team game, right, your process might be great, but you've got teammates whose processes aren't very good. And they're more reward outcome, outcome looking and, and they haven't refined their game. And as a result, it's very hard to control the outcome as one individual or two individuals in a team sport where it's impacted by multi individuals. So that is again, the value we talked about earlier, how important it is to get everybody to buy into the process, to buy into the fact that teams only going to be successful. if Everybody buys into the process of development and that every piece fits differently within the context of the team. So, you know, one person's process has to be a little bit different than another person's process because what you're asking from those individuals in the context of putting a lineup together or a team together is going to be different. Each individual's contribution within their process to succeeding in the role they're going to be in is critically important to the team being really good. So, I mean, you're trying to fit a lot of different pieces together and control a lot of different agendas to get people to understand that ultimately, yeah, you have your process, which is built to lead to this outcome. Another team might might have a process that's a little bit different because it's leading to a different outcome. You know, and another third person might have a little different process than both of you guys because their outcome is a little bit different that they need to get to in order for that team and those pieces to fit together to have success. So it is the hardest thing is to put in the work, you know, day in and day out with no guarantee on outcome because you don't have control over outcome. I mean, for sure. But the one thing is certain that if your process is flawed and it's bad, and you don't commit to it and you short circuit it all the time, your outcome is going to be affected negatively by it. I mean, you, I mean, you might. You might have a short term aberration around it where you can kind of get a little lucky, but you're not going to, you're not going to sustain or succeed. You know, you're not going to sustain success over a long period of time. And that's what good organizations are built on, right? They're built on a minor league system. They're built on scouting properly, identifying talent properly, and then player development so that you're taking the raw material in there and you're getting good coaching and good development. They understand the timeline. They slow it down for the player, get the player to buy into process. Don't worry about the big stadium in the major leagues because you're not going to be there for another three or four years and make sure that you take these steps appropriately from level to level so that you grow and mature at the right rate so that when you get to the major leagues, you you have staying power and the ability to actually stay up there because your game is built for the long term, not the short term splash. So Mm. that's, you know, again, that's the tiered system in nature of the minor league system. It goes different levels, the level to level to level. And it's, you know, those systems succeed based on scouts and player development and identifying the right talent, but then the player development people getting the talent to buy in the process and then making sure that the process is tiered because at each level, you know, you have to build out your process a little bit stronger because everything is getting filtered out and the competition is getting stronger. I had a friend, you made me think of a story, I had a friend growing up that, you know, like every Canadian kid played hockey, was playing the NHL. And he, he actually got yeah. drafted in the second round of the NHL. And I, I never played a game in the in the league. But you know, yeah. he, as he reflected back, I remember him saying one time, "When I was drafted in the second round, I thought I was really close, but I didn't realize how far away I was from actually playing in the in the top league in the world." And that that speaks to this process, and you know, instead of the outcome. But now, I, I would like to just jump here to, before we close off to talk about accountability. I, I would love to hear your thoughts on accountability because a lot of times this is hard for leaders to, to do this, right? Cause it involves difficult conversations, not always, but it, it, it can. And it, it, it's a bit of a hard space because you know what you want, but the communication part can be can be difficult if you don't have a lot of experience in in doing this right. So, how how do you manage accountability? Like, where where does that start and where does that end? Well, I mean, if you're talking about youth and teenagers, which would be you know sort of our junior level program, eighteen and under, then you know I always said the only consistency with teenagers is their inconsistency by and large. So, you can pretty much 
you know, expect that there's going to be inconsistencies with you and that's okay. Um, I think accountability comes with sacrifice and somebody explaining to you that that sacrifice, there, there, there is a reward for it. And the person has to be incentivized from the perspective of desiring the award. They have to be passionate about what that reward is. But you have to explain to them in a highly competitive world what that, you know, what that sacrifice and that accountability is going to lead to, you know, and, and you know, I, I kind of use an example, like, you know, young people, they're going to get caught up in the excitement of the reward, you know, like you mentioned that player that got drafted. So it's very easy to get drafted and then immediately you look at, in his case, the, the NHL product that is the end of the rainbow. I'm drafted, I'm drafted high, you know, and you start looking at the NHL arena, the NHL travel, the NHL um, glamour, the NHL on the ice and off the ice lifestyle. We can do that more easily. We can get in clubhouses and locker rooms just by our phones and by the internet these days. So, I mean, you can actually see it visually very early in the process. So it's, it's getting them to understand that, that you have to make, choices that are personal and that are that you that you care about enough to make certain sacrifices so that you give yourself the best opportunity to achieve and that to me is it's accountability to yourself you have to accountability to yourself before you're ever going to have accountability to the team because young people are incentivized by themselves you know i mean they haven't figured out that you know, sacrificing for the common good makes a lot of sense yet. They haven't figured out the value of, you know, where they fit within a team and, and how their sort of role can, can change as they move up levels. You know, as the competition gets more challenging, you know, maybe you were a big goal scorer for hockey and junior, but now you're going to be more of a role player and you get into the professional game. In our world in baseball, maybe – Maybe in high school you're a shortstop, but you're actually going to end up being a catcher as you move up, like Russell Martin was. You know, like you're going to have to be really, really incentivized, you know, to understand the sacrifices are worth it because the sacrifices are tough, right? I mean, it's, it's, you know, to be accountable and make sacrifices day in and day out, it needs to be explained to the person, you know, what that can lead to and why you feel that that level of accountability around your development process is important. You know, the decisions that you make off the field, you know, the, the friendships that you have, the, the, the times that you put in, uh, in terms of your training program, you know, the times where, you know, it seems like nobody's watching and it doesn't really matter. And maybe it doesn't really matter, matter. And maybe really nobody is watching, but it does matter in the big spectrum of things that you're accountable to your game every day, accountable to your growth, that you do everything possible to succeed because it's ultra competitive. Like, and, and the window for proper accountability and ultimately growth and maturity is really, really short. And it's really quick on the labeling side of things. So, I mean, it's really tough if you're not accountable at the right times in your career, if you're not committed at the right times in your career, the competitive nature of, of high performance sport will filter you out. And there's very few that can, can be unaccountable and can just kind of, you know, sort of do it however they want to do it. And they're going to succeed because I always say that's your, like, that's your one in a, you know, buy a lottery ticket. You, you got a lottery ticket based on, on your genes. You know, you're, you were real lucky, Yeah, but still it's, those players tend not to have the careers they're capable have, of having. They don't have the Hall of Fame career, the longevity, or those sorts of things. Because what happens is once it becomes a tie and that, that player or individual is somebody that's not accountable, everybody's been kind of putting up with that for a long period of time because of the talent. You know, you don't extend out with your career very long because they let you go once it's a tie because of the lack of accountability and the things that they have to deal with. And usually you're not invited back in post-playing career roles and opportunities where you transition because they realize, you know, that player got away and gets no accountability. And we did a lot of 
you know, we made a lot of exceptions based on the talent. So it's, I, I'd say you, you need to, it's a lot of communication and that's, that's what player development is. Yeah. And that's what the de- development of, of, of a person is. But, but Greg, it's, you've mentioned communication several times and I, I think, you know, what I'd like you to hit on before we wrap up here, because I know you uh, were running short on time, is the clarity of that communication and the honesty of it. Because a lot of leaders can get themselves in a bit of a, a bind, whether it's in sports or it's in business, by not being clear on what the expectations are or that employee or player situation is inside of the team, Right. Yeah, it's very important. I mean, it's very important to always say it's everybody has a strength and or a combination of strengths or something that's going to allow them to succeed to their ceiling. And many don't realize what it is. And I think for leaders, it's your responsibility to explain to them what you see in them that's going to allow them to succeed within the world that they want to succeed within. And it's your job to communicate that directly, transparently, and really honestly, like it is critical because that incentivizes the person to work hard within those parameters of development. You know, they, they then don't get caught up in some of the things that maybe they can't do, or they're not going to be asked to do because that's really not where their strengths lie. But you have to let somebody know what's going to allow them to succeed or what's going to, incentivize them to to want to put in the time, want to put in the work. Like everyone needs an incentive, you know, but they need clarity on where that work and that accountability and that commitment is going to lead to. And that to me is hugely important because if you don't give them the roadmap and you don't let them know what they have, that's going to separate them from somebody else. If they perfect it and put in the work to get there, then it's really hard for them to dig in every day. And it's really hard for them to commit. And it's really hard for them because, or they may be committing in a way that's counterproductive. They may be focusing on some aspect of their development that really isn't a strength and it's not going to be a strength. And it's not going to be something that you're going to be asking them to do as they move forward anyway. And they're going to be picking a fight or be in competition or perceived competition with somebody that you're not even evaluating them against. You know, and that can be in athletics and in business. I mean, for a promotion, I mean, they might think that they're on the management stream when they're actually not on the management stream, when they might be on the, you know, the floor stream where they're going to be the man, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be in a completely different, you know, element of the business or compartment of the business or department of the business. And in our world, it's, it's, it's the same. It's, you know, what are you going to be asked to do if everything comes together and if you make the sacrifices and the commitments on a day in a day out basis, where is it potentially going to lead and how do my, does my skill set and my talents align with what I'm hoping to get to? And sometimes you have to reprogram them. You know, you have to get them to understand that, yeah, that sounds great and it'd be wonderful, but you realize you're going to be like spending a lot of time trying to get somewhere or compete against a certain element of an individual that you're just, you're picking a fight, you're not going to win. But here's one over here that you can and you're really suited for and a role that I think you would be really good in. And this is why I believe you'd be really good in it. And I think you could be as good or better than anybody else that we're evaluating for that opportunity in that role. But you need to go about it a little bit differently and not worry about that person over there because you're really not being evaluated relative to that person. And you're really not in a fight with that person. It's this group that you're up against and this is what you're going to need to do to succeed in this element of our program or our team or our business so it, it's just giving them clarity of, of process and clarity of you know what it can lead to and and explaining to them why you feel they have the attributes to excel if they take that path within the organization or within the team um, or within the business and I think that's what incentive incentivizes anybody that's that's incentivizing them internally to find an outcome within your business, within your team, that's going to be something that's rewarding for them for putting in all the time and making all the sacrifices and being accountable to the process. Greg, one topic we have not hit on directly is the element of character. 
And there's obviously the skill side of it, which is, you know, how well do you hit? How well do you throw? How do you, you know, do all the skills that you have to do in order to play any game, including baseball? But what about character? Where does that fit into this equation? That's the one that I think everybody tries to put a finger on and, and, and tries to create that sort of one-to-one ratio that if, you know, there's a template that if you have these attributes, then you, you're going to have the perfect character. And if we can find a whole pile of people that have, quote-unquote, the identified characteristics, we have a team of perfect characters. And I think it's 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 a slippery slope if you if you try to pigeonhole or put character into a clearly defined box because if you're in clubhouses and locker rooms you realize that there's a lot of different personalities a lot of different characters um a lot of different character traits and 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 that that you know that actually enrich your your clubhouse or your 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 locker room and 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 make you better and and you know so i think for me i've always said especially you're dealing with youth um you know be flexible i think we know the outer boundaries of what's acceptable on character and what's not. I think we all pretty much align in, in that area, knowing that certain character traits are just unacceptable and they're just not going to work. And either they're, they're, you know, you can't bring that trait into your clubhouse, or your locker room, or else you have to filter it out if it persists. Um, but within that, there's I mean, a wide range. And I think you want to give individuals the latitude to kind of grow into their personalities, their characters. And I've always said that, that, you can have, you, you can differ in kind of how you go about it. You can have a little different character, the, the way you approach things. But the key to character to me is, again, if, as long as it's not outside the bounds of what's acceptable, which I think we line up on, is, is do your character traits get in the way of your success? And if your character traits don't get in the way of your, your success, then I think we can all work within that. And, we, and, and it's important for us to find a way to kind of work within it and get you to be the best character, you know, the best of the character that you bring to the table and polish some of those edges. But again, it's, it's if you're a really intense person and you're, and you're, you know, really emotional and fired up all the time, I mean, does that get in the way of success? I mean, are you, are you getting in your own way? Are you too emotional, too fired up? Is that leading to problems for you? in terms of outcome and, and, and accomplishing success and within the team, you know, does your energy level get away from you so that you do things that are costing your team or hurting your team? You know, if you're too passive and you don't show enough emotion, you know, are you aggressive enough? Do you compete hard enough? Are you willing to dig in hard enough? Do you push back hard enough or do you need, you know, that something that becomes problematic. So um, again, I think as long as it is within the realm of, what's acceptable and I think we know what that is at least we have a pretty good idea where the outer range lies what we can accept in character I think we have to be flexible in in incorporating and trying to create the best of each individual's potential and around character and 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 get them to again clearly understand you know the key is make sure it helps you make sure it's a positive part of your game a positive part of your you know contributes to your team in a positive way and it doesn't get in the way of your success or ultimate outcome. There, there can be too much flexibility, though, as well in the character rate. You know, so we make excuses for somebody's character because they're, you know, they've got a, you know, one point two OPS, as opposed to somebody that's hitting them below the Mendoza line, right? That, that, that can you can fall victim to that as a leader, though, too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, it's it's uh, that's when it's getting in the way, right? It's getting in the way, so. You know, you're not. When I say getting in the way, it's 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 hurting outcome individually or collectively. So if your personality traits and your character are, are, are hurting the outcome of the of the team, or they're they're hurting you individually in terms of of your ability to contribute in in to your you know, your your maximum potential, then you know those things need to get modified, adjusted, tempered, you know, filtered out a little bit. Um, yeah. that's when, you know, to me, character becomes problematic and, and yeah, I mean, you, you have a flexibility around it, but you're always having a keen eye to see whether or not it's getting in the way. And sometimes with young players, you know, you, you, you've got to give it a little time, right? Like you, you, you can't always force outcome in the immediate time frame. You have to give a little bit in order to let them see the negative aspect of how they're going about it and how their character is actually hurting them. So that you've got, 
you know, there's no better teaching moments than when people fail, right? I mean, those are the greatest teaching moments that you're ever going to have. So, I mean, if you have somebody that's, that's succeeded a ton and you bring them into your group and they come in because they caught your eye and they're, you know, they're, they're a high achiever where they've come from, but you have a pretty good idea that, hey, this is a differing level and there's different expectations here and the competitive nature is going to be higher and you've got a pretty good sense that they're going to probably fail for the for certain reasons that you see. The best thing you can do is let them fail as opposed to going and telling them that, hey, now you're here. In order to succeed here, you got to do this, 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 and this, or you're going to have no chance. Because the worst thing that can happen is you tell them that and they go out the first day in your world and they have success. Because now, and, and that success is probably not sustainable for the reasons that you're identifying, but you've kind of lost a little bit with them because you just told them that if they do it this way, it's not going to work. And in a isolated instance or circumstance on day one, it actually worked. And you're looking at it saying, hey, I worked today, but good luck in the long, long game here because it's not going to work over the long haul. This is going to get you. But it worked today. So, I mean, to me, you kind of let them stub their toe a little bit you let them have some failure around what you identify as problematic and something that's going to be problematic for them in your world. But it's better that they fail a little bit without you telling them that it's going to be problematic before they've actually failed. And then it gives you a great opportunity to kind of have a teaching moment because when they're failing, they're looking for help more often than not. There's so much to the idea of focusing on process over outcome. The more I read up on this very simple mind shift in business, the more I realize it totally makes sense. It takes us back to an episode from last year on key performance indicators. So check that out, mindyourfarmbusiness.com. You know, Nick Saban, head football coach at University of Alabama, is famous for talking regularly about the process. He once said, there's no continuum for success. Focus on the progress, not the results wise, wise advice from a great coach. I think there are many business takeaways from the discussion today with Greg Hamilton of Baseball Canada. Whether it's building a roster of individuals focused on the team first, the importance of adversity to development, and how character leads to achieving your potential. Greg really hit it out of the park today. I hope you enjoyed today's discussion. If you have any feedback or comments, please email me at shaney at realagriculture.com or call the Real Ag Feedback line at 855-776-6147. You can find more episodes of Mind Your Farm Business at mindyourfarmbusiness.com. Thanks to RBC Royal Bank. And until next time, keep on minding your farm business. <laughs>